quality um, by um, 2020. And that's, that's been led by this project called Scatter, which has been co-funded by Bayes, which talks about the options and the policies and what's feasible for Greater Manchester to follow between now and 2040. And let me just focus on natural capital in that respect, because the research as part of this that led up to last year's um, summit suggested that, for example, in addition to energy generation and energy efficiency measures, in terms of natural capital, 16.8 kilometres squared of derelict or underused land may need to be used for energy generation and storage here in Greater Manchester. 17% of land would need to be used for bioenergy crops. 75% of peatland would need to be restored. And 3 million trees would need to be planted by 2035 and 5 million by 2050. A more detailed work is being undertaken to understand how we can meet these targets and set out a detailed set of actions as part of that emerging five-year environmental plan. And that plan will be launched at the next Mayor's Green Summit on the 25th of March at um, the Lowry. Now, in 2014, uh, around 54% of the world's population were living in towns and cities, and this is projected to increase to nearly 70% by the middle of this century. Almost two-thirds of the urban area that will exist by the year 2030 is yet to be built. So what could this potentially mean, especially in terms of the areas that you're interested in? Well, it could mean increased quantities of grain infrastructure and decreased quantities of green and blue infrastructure. And what could that lead to? Well, it could lead to increased runoff of rain from hard surfaces, leading to increased flood risk, increased heat island effects, increased cooling costs, and uh, reduced productivity, negative mental and physical and environmental health impacts, leading to pressures on public health and social costs. So the consequences of some of this, if we don't get it right for natural capital, has, much far, has far reaching consequences to many other areas of public policy. And whilst an increase in urbanization might be, might be required to meet our growth, our economic growth aspirations, we do need to ensure, therefore, that our natural capital, so the quality of the environment and the ecosystem services it provides, is sufficient to support greater concentrations of people and businesses and enhance the quality of life for residents. And so we need to think about how well-managed natural environments can help. The natural environment is key to economic growth, it is key to further urbanisation. We need to think much more about that than we have done to date. Now I think we're in quite a good position in Greater Manchester for a number of reasons, one of which is that Greater Manchester has been designated as the UK's urban pioneer for natural capital under the, UK, the government's 25-year economic plan. And in this role, Greater Manchester is working with the Environment Agency and other partners to deliver and develop innovative uh, delivery and finance models to accelerate the deployment of green and blue infrastructure. Now, our natural capital assets provide people with a, a wide range of free products. And we really need to remember that in terms of the importance that we attach to natural capital. Free goods and services, often called ecosystem services which underpin our economy and society and increase the quality of life of our citizens. So natural capital is or should be completely ingrained with all of our other priorities for the residents of Greater Manchester. No contradiction at all. If anything, it's highly complementary. Now the urban pioneer is seeking to secure an increase in both the quantity and the quality of our natural capital assets whilst engaging with Greenwich Manchester's residents so that they can better understand and access the natural environment and the benefit it provides. And to support this, the key five objectives uh, of this uh, work are set out on this slide. Firstly, to develop the evidence base. Secondly, to demonstrate a place-based approach. Thirdly, 
to create a natural capital investment plan, which is why we're all here today. Fourthly, to identify a demonstrator project. And lastly, to develop and test a communications and engagement model. And I just want to go through those points in a little bit more depth. The natural capital approach um, uses the valuation of these benefits to society to ensure that the decisions we make are based on holistic, real-world scenarios. And this requires the qualification, the quantification, and sometimes the monetization of these benefits. And we'll be talking in, in more depth about all of those areas during the course of today. But there are various ways of understanding and communicating the extent, condition, and value of natural capital at a local scale, such as in private estates, protected landscapes, and natural reserves. There are also methods of producing accounts that would be recognized by the accountancy profession or in national accounts. I just want to point this out to you, uh, mapping Greater Manchester. This provides um, a local assessment of natural capital and ecosystem service opportunities. And by understanding the types of land that make up Greater Manchester and capturing the current baseline of what Greater Manchester's existing natural, na natural environment is doing in terms of the benefits it is providing to us, we will have a better understanding of its value to us and how we can maintain and enhance it over time to maximize these benefits. And I come back to this point to say that natural capital is ingrained and joined up with everything else that we're doing at a greater Manchester level. And to make that point, we've set out in boxes there the entire um, policy development agenda for the combined authority and the 10 uh, districts. I want to focus on the spatial framework, though, which was launched for consultation on the uh, 7th of uh, January. And that's been produced by all 10 councils working together in partnership, and it aims to ensure that we have the right land available in the right places to deliver the homes and jobs we need up to 2035. And the consultation includes a number of key policies around the natural environment, including biodiversity, net gain, and green space standards. So I would encourage you, if you haven't already, to look at the documents for the GMSF and look at the opportunities that it provides for natural capital over the next 20 years in Greater Manchester. And Natural England has been working with us on developing an approach for embedding a biodiversity and ultimately natural capital net gain approach into the planning system. A net gain guidance document is being produced to support planners, councillors and other relevant stakeholders. And the guidance will sit alongside the GMSF and complement the Greater Manchester Natural Capital Investment Plan by helping to identify and target investment into the areas that will provide the biggest benefits for people and wildlife. So, how does natural capital exactly benefit Greater Manchester? So a natural capital as a account has been developed, as I say, for Greater Manchester and its 10 districts. And this is about capturing the current baseline of how Greater Manchester's existing natural environments are performing in terms of the ecosystem services they are providing. And we have calculated that each year, Greater Manchester receives nearly 900 million pounds worth of benefits from, ex from its existing natural capital. So before we even talk about enhancing it, that's the benefit we get from our existing natural capital. And we really need to do, we need to spread the message about the benefits across all policy areas that we actually get from natural capital in Greater Manchester. We've broken them down into different areas on the left-hand side. And by the way, you can find out much more about that from the Urban Pioneer work that we've published online. So you can download this document to get more information in detail. But have a look at some of those points on the right-hand side. The extent to which natural capital prevents hospital admissions, the number of, avoid, of, of, of life years lost, um, the buildings that receive noise mitigation as a result of natural capital, um, the contribution it makes towards people's physical activity. Lots of benefits, and lots of benefits that as a society we just don't appreciate, and we really need to get that message, as I say, across. Because well-managed natural environments help remove and store carbon, they reduce pollution, 
improve air quality, improve soil structures, they store water, so reducing and preventing flooding, purify our water, make areas nicer, more friendly, more attractive, more inviting, and help get people out of cars and encourage walking, cycling and running, as well as helping to clean our air, uh, cool our cities and towns, reduce flood risk. It also helps pollination and contributes to food production and importantly provides homes, shelter and food for wildlife. And that's why there are so many opportunities or so many opportunities that should be available via our natural capital um, investment uh, plan. Um, the CA, the Command Authority in Natural Course, have commissioned the study which has led to this plan uh, to develop this first natural capital investment plan for the city region. It's a key outcome of the first Green Summit. It will promote investment opportunities that protect and enhance natural capital to support a healthy population and economy. And this is, and this is very, very important, this is the first plan of its type at a city region scale, delivering a truly innovative approach to financing natural capital projects, which can then be replicated elsewhere. So the entire country should be looking at what we're intending to do as part of this plan. And as stated earlier, work is underway to develop a five-year environmental plan for Greater Manchester, which will include key recommendations and actions from the Natural Capital Investment Plan, which will be launched at the next Green uh, Summit in March and will be a key component of our achieving our carbon neutral objectives. So I mentioned earlier that part of this process is about demonstrating uh, demonstrator projects. And, and uh, here's one. So we've already begun to demonstrate the use of a natural capital approach in practice. Um, now, through the um, Water Resilient Cities project, a uh, business in the community working with United Utilities, has uh, initiated a sustainable urban drainage retrofit project at Moreland's Junior School in Sale. And this is really, really exciting and really innovative. What happens is that United Utilities charge the school for surface water removal and do so in bands based on calculated volumes of water. Now, by installing such solutions and disconnecting that surface water from the sewer, the school then drops down a charging band. And the money saved from doing that then pays back the cost of installing this scheme to the school. And look at this point that we've added it into this. That we estimate, and util United Utilities estimate, that sustainable drainage schemes like this could save up to £1.75 million a year for education budgets if all of our schools adopted similar measures. Incredible. So even if you've not got a particular interest in natural capital, you should have an interest in the money that it would save you that can then go onto frontline education. Now to ensure the benefits are achieved, people do need to know what is available to them and where to find information. And over the past 12 months, there's been a targeted communications campaign called Connecting People with Nature. A new website's been launched which brings together the key natural environment stakeholders and their initiatives being delivered across Greater Manchester. The website is uh, naturegreatermanchester.co.uk. Uh, Lancashire Wildlife Trust have also launched their new campaign, My Wild City, in March, aimed at increasing uh, green spaces and enhancing wildlife across Greater Manchester. And they've also launched a dedicated website which includes further information and signposting to resources. So what next? Well, although we're making good progress in terms of reducing carbon uh, emissions in uh, Greater Manchester, we know that a business as usual approach will not get us to our longer term goals, both in terms of uh, carbon neutrality and in terms of the wider environmental agenda. We need to adopt a green aspiration mentality to accelerate the point at which we can become a cleaner, greener, carbon neutral city region. But let's be clear, this won't be without challenges. We need to significantly scale up our activities, 
moving from demonstration of what is possible to realizing our full potential. To do this, we need to create investment frameworks which provide the capacity to develop viable projects. And that's what this plan that you were talking about today is all about. The emerging EU-funded Ignition project will help to support this through the creation of investment readiness uh, fund and a project development unit. But we also need to broaden the range of potential sources of investment in natural capital. And we're looking at ways in which revenues can be generated and mechanisms developed to attract a wider range of private sector and alternative sources of investments. There is no easy solution, and we can only achieve this by creating cr a credible plan, a credible plan for people, communities, and businesses. So as part of your discussions today, especially in the seminars later on, I'd encourage you to be ambitious. Consider how you can build on your existing evidence-based plans and initiatives to define a sustainable Greater Manchester that is fit for the future and seize the opportunities that come with setting ambitious goals. Thank you. So thank you, Councillor Glatis. Um, he's given you a really good overview of some of the work that's going on in Greater Manchester, and um, he's thankfully going to stick around for the question and answer panel at the end of this session. We've got three really um, fantastic speakers for you now, um, all experts in their field. Um, the first, uh, it's another change to the, uh, uh, the agenda, actually. Emma Howard Boyd, unfortunately, has had a family bereavement, can't be with us, but she is ably deputised uh, Neil Davis, who's the Director of Future Funding at the Environment Agency, to talk to us about why, natural, um, why people invest in, um, in natural capital and resilience. We're then going to have uh, Ian Dickey, who was uh, heavily involved in developing the Natural Capital Investment Plan, talking about the investment plan itself, and then Louise Wilson, who's co-founder and managing director of Abundance Investment, on what do organisations look for when investing in natural capital. Uh, I know some of you started to tweet already. I should have said that if you want to follow this on Twitter or if you want to tweet about the event, we're using hashtag GM Green City. Um, and I'd like to, first of all, welcome Neil Davis to come and give his address. Thank you. Good morning, uh, every, everyone. Um, and uh, as Mark has just said, it's, uh, I'm standing in for... Emma, uh, Emma Howard, who dearly did want to be here uh, today because, she, as many of you may know, she has been at the forefront of, um, of finance and uh, sustainable finance in particular. So this did, uh, the, the whole agenda within Greater Manchester really did resonate with, uh, with her, not just in her role as, as chair of the Environment Agency, but also in her previous professional life and a wider um, professional um, activities as well. So um, I, what I'm going to try and do today is, is stick very much to the messages that um, Emma wanted to uh, convey um, as part of her speech um, this, this morning. Um, just very briefly by way of background, um, as Mark said, I'm Director of Future Funding within the Environment Agency, and that is very new. Um, that whole remit is new because of the agendas such as the one going on in Greater Manchester. We've realized that there are so many tremendous pressures um, that uh, need to be addressed. And one of the keys to unlock the potential that we have for generating um, beautiful cities and life enhancing cities is through um, the, the investments uh, that can be directed by natural capital. So we are looking at how we can try and make sure the fact that that can happen through innovative uh, financing, um, financing approaches. Um, so uh, the Environment Agency does, of course, have a, have a role in, 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 in all of this. And generally, our work is to create a, a better place for people and wildlife uh, to support sustainable development in, in England. And that involves uh, taking on waste criminals, um, keeping people safe in flood incidents, to helping green um, spaces flourish and helping sustainable, uh, sustainable development. And I know the area team here uh, has been working very closely with, um, with a combined authority on the whole um, uh, work that you're doing today. 
for me, it has been a privilege because I spend most of my career helping to uh, improve uh, the environment and protect uh, people from flooding. And in that time, uh, which has been quite a considerable amount of time, I've witnessed a transition from generally what people think is um, as, as, as add-ons in, in addressing uh, environmental issues, primarily through, through regulation, uh, and transitioning to making sure the fact that those considerations are at the heart of decision-making. Uh, decision um, and what has helped that transition is that now we are valuing much more um, the high quality environment uh, and a resilient environment as, uh, as, as well. And the adoption of natural capital takes us further along that journey <clears throat> by helping us make decisions on the most appropriate investments that will improve the lives of people and wildlife. The government's 25 year environment plan uh, has at its heart the, the use of natural capital to address the, the nation's uh, challenges. So what are some of those uh, challenges? Well, the quality of the air that we breathe is still not as good as it should be. Our rivers need to provide cleaner and more plentiful uh, water and the dry periods that we've had over the, 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 the many, many months uh, shows uh, the, um, the risk that we are at uh, in terms of uh, making that a reality. We need to protect thousands more people and properties from um, flooding. There's a huge amount of investment that goes into, uh, uh, into that already, but we know that there is more for the future. And we need to make sure that we have thriving and abundant uh, wildlife as, uh, as, as, as well. And on top of this, climate change has a significant impact. Last year, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change said that we have 12 years to limit global temperature rise to one and a half degrees centigrade above pre-industrial levels. Otherwise, we face hotter days, fiercer fires, bigger storms, rising and more acidic seas, shifting crop patterns, and the spread of tropical diseases. Also this year, the World Economic Forum's Global Risks Report says that the two biggest risks facing the world are extreme weather events, and the failure of climate change adaptation and mitigation. Addressing these challenges requires significant investment. We know, for example, that in England alone, we need in the region of 100 billion pounds to reduce flood risk. We know that we need around 30 billion pounds to give us clean and plentiful water. The practical job of preparing our growing society and natural environment for the physical impacts of climate change requires businesses, government, NGOs, landowners, communities, and regulators to help each other. So a fundamental question we should ask is, how are we going to make long-term investments that provide profit and greater resilience for society? Now that ambition isn't just wishful thinking. The UK's greenhouse gas emissions in 2017 had reduced to 43% below 1990 levels. And throughout that whole period, the economy grew. Progress has not been uniformly strong in all sectors. However, the success reductions of emissions from the UK power sector suggest that we can afford to be realistic and optimistic at the same time. The next step is greater emphasis on preparing for the physical risks of climate change. That's not to say that we let up the pressure to reduce emissions, far from it, but it's to say that much climate change is already locked in to global weather systems, and there's no point building energy efficient infrastructure that could be washed away in tomorrow's flood or melted in the next heat wave. Businesses do have a significant role to play in this. They have a lot to gain from understanding environmental risks and realizing the long-term opportunities for investors. The environment, generally, is not properly represented in boardrooms. 
Company boards have to take environmental risks seriously and not see it as an operational expense. This goes for their own impacts like pollution incidents, and it also applies to how they and their customers are affected by the natural world. As climate change increasingly bites, boards should put aside capital expenditure to better prepare for events like floods and heat waves to ensure a greater degree of business continuity. <laughs> If businesses collaborate to make areas more resilient, as we have around um, Greater Manchester, they can drive down costs and ensure whole districts are able to resume commerce quickly after storms have passed. Very soon, shareholders and customers will be demanding this in concert. As a society, we should be looking to increase resilience to natural, sh natural shocks by using green infrastructure. And as the Environment Agency, we want to make sure we can help deliver this. Natural flood management and soil improvement are key ambitions of the government's 25-year environment plan. And this work also creates better green places for wildlife and tourism. But at an individual and company level, financial incentives for resilience should be explored further too. As a government's urban pioneer, Greater Manchester is a global leader, showing other cities a potential for pursuing development using a natural capital approach. The authority's ambition to create a green city region at the forefront of action on climate change with clean air and a flourishing natural environment sets the tone. The Ignition project that they've got, which is part EU of EU funders, as it stands, sets a first target, the 10% increase in green infrastructure. What does this all look like in practice? We, the Environment Agency, want to be a strong partner for you. I know that we've been working with Manchester City Council and the developer UNI at Mayfield, the £1 billion redevelopment of the old Royal Mail dep Depot near Piccadilly. And through working with businesses involved to support investment in natural capital before building begins. Uh, this is involved deculverting and renaturalizing the river, uh, opening that up in reducing flood risk and creating new park areas. That also protects the area and creates green, uh, more green space that developers can, uh, through which developers can expect a longer and greater return. I also know that the work is going on to support Salford and Manchester with the natural capital aspects of the bid for the Northern Gateway, a £1 billion investment over 20 years that will create 15,000 new homes along the River Irk. We can help ensure the river is revealed and another city park can be created. We're also working with Natural England to develop a Greater uh, Manchester City Region policy for net gain, as Councillor Canottis just mentioned, and that will help planning development. This will address degradation in natural capital, improve the benefits and services provided to Greater Manchester by the environment, and it will help developers with the planning process. Clearly, there's a need for some funding to develop investable projects, uh, and you are already on with that with the initiative to create an environment fund that will support and deliver environmental outcomes across the city region. In addition, there are plans to create an investment readiness fund of around £1 million to support environmental projects to become investment ready, as well as scoping and testing the politi political appetite for a carbon market to be set up in Greater Manchester. This could offset carbon production in the city by investing in local projects. All of these are vital to lay the foundations of a successful natural capital investment plan. Individual, individual cities need to be able to attract investment on their own terms, but they're all part of wider networks. The whole UK needs a strategy too. This spring, the government has committed to publish the UK's first ever green finance strategy, setting out the steps they are taking to attract investment needed into our clean economy and cementing the UK's position as a global leader. That will be important in setting the conditions to incentivise sustainable financing and investments. 
We're uh, working with colleagues at, in DEFRA and from the Department for Biz, Business, Enterprise, and Innovation and Skills, BAYS, on this. We're also working with other European countries to set standards for sustainable investment. These initiatives are vital to create the environment for investments in natural capital. We want to learn from you here to inform how our input to these um, important initiatives can be, can be shaped. Anyone th who thinks you can have um, infinite growth on a finite planet is either a madman or an economist. That was a statement by David Attenborough recently at the, the Davos, um, the Davos uh, uh, Forum. Climate change and the demand of the world's growing population means we are faced with some big questions about the way societies operate. A key message Emma wanted to give today is that businesses can't afford to wait for someone else to develop the systems and infrastructure needed to help their workforces, networks, customers and communities to prosper through the coming storms. Once our environment is gone, we can't buy it back. So we should find our opportunities in the long-term investments that will allow our future generations to prosper, just as those of us in this room are fortunate enough to do so today. Thank you to Greater Manchester for your ambition. It is a type of leadership we need to see in order for that vision to become the reality. Thank you for listening. that could be developed uh, may look like as well uh, and finish off with some of the recommendations that we'll pick up in the workshops later. So, Thank you. Uh, and th thank you, Mark. And, and thank you for the invitation for, uh, to be here and thank you all of you for coming. Uh, it's great to see such a large audience. Uh, so my name is Ian Dickey. I'm one of the directors of FTEC. stands for Economics for the Environment Consultancy. So to avoid the wrath of David Attenborough, I'm going to describe to you what an environmental economist is, because uh, we're different to normal economists. Um, so we're interested in how changes in the environment affect the welfare of people. So to do that, we have to understand the environment, work with environmental scientists, uh, people with technical understanding of the environment, and we have to apply economics uh, to understand the effects on people. Um, if you want a less technical definition, I'm a bird watcher who did an economics degree. Um, We've been working with our partners in this project, Countryscape and Environmental Finance, to have the right skills uh, to do this work. It is multidisciplinary, and I want to thank uh, Combined Authority for asking us to do this and the funding from Natural Course. Um, it's been a very interesting piece of work, uh, and as has been said, hopefully uh, a leader in what city regions can do. Um, so I'm going to give uh, a quick descri description of the context we were working in, um, what we mean by natural capital investment, uh, describe to you the plan and the finance models and the recommendations we've put together. Uh, so as has already been said, this was a priority from the Green Summit last year. Um, and we're working in a picture where really funding of natural capital works on quite a limited range of sources, mainly from the public sector. Um, and there's not many business models and financing strategies available, so we need to diversify and grow that. Um, we're trying to deliver a, a vision as part of the Greater Manchester City region where investments in natural capital can enhance social, environmental, and economic outcomes. Uh, and you know the emphasis there on people, so outcomes for people, and that's why this is led by uh, environmental economists. Um, those outcomes we're interested in, so people's health. I'm putting that first because the history of kind of environmental management is that that water pollution. We see now clear evidence about access to green space, performance of natural capital in a range of ways that affects people's health. We've got that evidence to act. Um, air quality also and it had just been mentioned. Uh, and we also have objectives to stop the loss of habitats and wildlife and restore them. Um, we need these to uh, tackle climate change, both uh, mitigation of emissions, sequestration in the natural environment, and also it's a key tool in adaptation, particularly around water and flooding. Um, also in terms of uh, encouraging sustainable travel, so 
natural capital enhances other forms of capital that enable uh, sustainable transport. Uh, that improves places that people live. Uh, it can increase money going into the local economy and all in all make more resilient communities. So that's the vision for Greater Manchester in a quick summary. Um, so what do we mean by getting investment into those things? Um, well, it's all about getting a return to the investor. So this is a change of perspective for the environment sector, thinking not just what are the returns to wider society, we're used to making that argument, what are the returns to the investor? Uh, and in particular, in particular, sorry, what makes an investable natural capital project? Um, attract inv investment because of the size and predictability of the revenue streams. Uh, and from that, the size, timing, regularity of the returns to the investor. It also needs to result in a positive impact on natural capital. So we're looking for the combination of those things. And it will need a business plan to give people confidence that those things will happen. And again, that's a bit of a challenge for the environment sector because we're not necessarily used to writing business plans in that context. So there is a market for investment in natural capital. As I said, it's limited. We want to expand it. Uh, and you see here the two sort of parts we want to bring together. Um, there's a good evidence that there's good demand for capital investment in Manchester, so demand from different projects, the capability to invest in natural capital, um, but we need to do more to bring the supply into the picture. Um, and we can think about that supply outside the public sector in sort of across a perspective, uh, so from the philanthropic at one end to mainstream investment at the other. And if we think about their different characteristics, what kind of business model are they after? Um, well, the, the philanthropic end is not so interested in revenue generation, uh, whereas you need very robust business models for the mainstream investors at the other end. Um, the form of investment they will make will be different from grant giving to more commercial lending in mainstream investment. And the types of institutions involved are also different. Um, so how do we move across this uh, um, sort of group? So traditionally, the environment sector has been um, to the left of this dotted line as you look at it, um, apart from public sector uh, drawing on philanthropic sources, uh, we want to move to the right of that line. So we want to blend finance across those groups. So you're not going to jump straight to mainstream investors, but if you can mix different investment types, then you've got a chance to, to move into a wider range of funders, access more variety of funding, and therefore greater funding for natural capital. So what's in the plan to try and get that to happen? So we define a, a pipeline of um, project types which need investment, um, some finance models for uh, facilitating private sector investment, but also then defining the role of the public sector in relation to that, and as I said, some recommendations to put this into practice over the next five years. Um, so these things are also in the uh, investment plan summary. I hope you picked up a copy of on the way in. Uh, and in this pipeline, so the top left-hand quadrant, there's uh, the project types that we think are most likely to be investable in the short term. Um, so those are in a bit, bit larger here, so you can hopefully see them from the back. Um, and from these, so these are things people might invest in, but they're not the finance models that will enable that investment. So from these, we define three finance models. And two of them, so sustainable drainage schemes, as was already described, have their own uh, mechanism for achieving financial return. And similarly with the place-based model, although it's less widely known, it would be described in one of the workshops, um, and there's already a, a model with returns there. Uh, several of the others, um, actually different ways of generating returns, but they can actually do that in potentially ways that are, can be stacked in the same project, providing that's carefully managed. Um, and so we put those together into a carbon and habitat banks financial model. And you'll see I haven't got catchment scale initiatives in there, and they actually can cut across several of these things. So they might work as providing benefits in each of those models. So that's how we came to three uh, finance models that we thought were most likely to generate um, investment in Greater Manchester. Um, and I'll just describe those a few features about them in a bit more detail. So this has already actually been uh, mentioned about the, the mechanism of water companies, but maybe the, the important point to make here is it's not just about uh, water company action, it's also the land use planning and policy and the regulatory environment that's very influential on water company actions. Those things need to align to, to make this model more investable. Uh, but there's a mechanism there, and as was described, an opportunity. Um, the place-based model, 
Um, so as I said, maybe less widely known about in the UK. So this is an idea where you put the management of green spaces into a long-term lease under a trust. And that's a very important framing because the condition of the lease can be that you have to maintain the assets, which obviously would be a, a key criteria. But that trust model then has some more flexibility compared to public sector management of green spaces. They can uh, borrow money to invest for the longer term that can be a barrier in the public sector. And they can be more flexible in trying to provide services from those green spaces. So things like nature-based prescribing models that generate revenues, uh, they can invest to provide those services. We know this is uh, scalable because there are extensive access across Greater Manchester, and we've seen this model being used elsewhere. Um, but there's some research needed to define exactly how it could be applied in Greater Manchester, because there are already existing trusts that might provide some of the structures that we need for this kind of model. So that needs to be developed further to generate the business case. And then finally on uh, habitat and carbon banking, um, so this is a, a, the idea that you create credits for habitat or, or carbon where these things have been enhanced and that's used to compensate um, for impacts elsewhere. Uh, with habitat there's potential to mandate the mechanism for this as been described with the spatial framework. Carbon, it remains a voluntary market but with a significant political push uh, to address carbon emissions. Again, we know it's scalable because there's a significant amount of development planned in Greater Manchester and there are significant carbon emissions. So we know there are going to be those negative impacts that can be compensated. And there's certainly a supply of land that can be enhanced in these respects. Uh, peatland's already been mentioned, other habitats as well. Um, this is one that does need particular political leadership uh, because these are non-market goods essentially. So the way to create markets for them is to have the right structures in place and regulatory drivers. Okay, um, so there's a set of actions defined in the plan, and uh, I won't obviously read these out, but there's, uh, they sort of divide up. So there's an idea of investment readiness. Uh, I was already described the funding being put in place to support that. Um, in short term, having the right political appetite in place, and then creating the capacity I talked about in the environment sector uh, to develop business plans. Um, there's a wider political support, which starts with publishing this plan. Um, there's some learning we can take from the social investment market and to continue to reduce barriers to natural capital investment in the long term. And then within the individual finance models, there are specific actions that can be taken uh, to take those forward. Um, with the design of the uh, Investment Readiness Fund, as I said, there's some different capacity needed that might not be traditionally uh, extensively in place in the, the environment sector. So bringing in different financing skills, uh, maybe different governance structures to oversee investments. Um, and so there's going to be, you know, there's learning from the uh, people who have those skills to understand the environment sector. There's learning from the environment sector to integrate with those skills. Those things need to be brought together to create stronger capacity for delivery, writing the right business plans, having the right accountability on investment to give people confidence to invest. Um, again, these things are described in more detail in the plan. But it's um, good to think about Manchester Greater Manchester leading the way on these things. And the position we're in is we have uh, done natural capital account for Greater Manchester. We have a good understanding of the assets that are here. And we're in a position where there's an opportunity for innovation. So this is an example of innovation from uh, New York City, the High Line. There's opportunities for innovation in these finance models in Greater Manchester. Uh, but keeping for the investment plan to work a focus on the returns they can generate. Um, so I hope you find the day's discussions positive to build on the investment plan uh, we've put together. It's a first step in these things, and I'm looking forward to the questions and discussions. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ian. And uh, Ian will be joining us on the panel, so there'll be chances to ask questions later. I'm very pleased to welcome Louise Wilson, who's co-founder and managing director of Abundance Investment. She's going to be talking to us about the key drivers for investors, what the key barriers are, and give us some examples of where this has worked previously, uh, just in the nick of time. Yes. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let me just get back to... There we go. Uh, so good morning, everybody. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here, despite some travel problems from London, not related to weather, but uh, we took a little detour via Birmingham. 
Um, but so I'm very pleased to be here now, particularly uh, in the Science and Industry Museum. It was a great uh, draw to actually go and spend some time. And uh, there's something going on next door where people were whooping. And I was like, is that the conference? So uh, I really felt like I was going to have to come on and do something spectacular. But anyway, <laughs> down to something a bit more mundane. Um, so I'm here to kind of give you an, an investor's view. Um, just by way of background, um, my first career was in investment banking. Please don't all boo now. Um, and I left in 2008. I left in July, literally just before the wheels came off. I promise you it wasn't my fault. Um, but I left because actually over a, the kind of preceding five, probably more years than that, I was beginning to just kind of feel like finance was missing the point. Or maybe that financial services was missing the point and that everything seemed to kind of rotate and bow to, if you like, the altar of money as the end, rather than as the means to the end. Um, so I felt that I just didn't want to be part of that anymore, and actually I wanted to kind of step out of that and try and work out a way to do it differently. Although actually my journey to it was through the environment. You know, I became increasingly concerned about the fact that the economic equation doesn't stack up and we need to do something, and we need to do it really urgently. And certainly I feel on the back of uh, news that was coming out towards the end of last year with COP24 and the IPCC report saying we only have 12 years left, that, you know, the time is now and the time must be now. So that's a little bit of background in terms of me and where I've come from, but then to kind of take you into uh, what I think is happening in institutional capital which I think has, is, is essential. I've always been convinced of that, but I didn't know how it was going to change it, its ways, if you like. But just um, to, to, so to the question, is institutional investing changing? Well, the answer is definitely yes. And actually, I think it's changing very rapidly. Is it changing rapidly enough? Is a different question. But certainly, I think once you start to get the momentum going, that is really positive. And from everybody here in this room and the sorts of projects that you're looking at, and wanting to see come to pass, then hopefully that should mean that begins to become easier um, and, uh, and you're pushing more on an open door. And I hope to kind of give you some things to think about uh, in terms of what do you do to transition from this pool of money that probably you've felt isn't particularly been accessible to you before now, but is potentially becoming more accessible. And then also I'll obviously talk about what it is that um, we do now at Abundance. So when I was investment banking, sitting in the city of London, um, this thing appeared around the 1980s, 90s called SRI, Socially Responsible Investing. In actual fact, it's been around for about 200 years. Uh, it was the Quakers, I think, that probably first coined the term. But it really didn't make any kind of appearance in any way in the city or in, in um, professional investing until as late as this. But it was a good start, but really it was about negative screening. I won't invest in tobacco stocks because they kill people. I won't invest in arms companies. And it didn't really go much further than that. Than that. So it was a sort of negatively based um, movement, if you like, or drive, rather than a positively based one. Then in 2005, that's the first time um, that we had the concept of environmental, social, and governance. Um, and that was on the back of, and forgive me if you know all of this, but I will say it anyway, um, that was on the back of um, United Nations when Kofi Annan was um, still in place, a, a letter that he sent to 50 CEOs saying, how can we make money change its ways? He didn't quite put it that way, I'm paraphrasing. Um, and in the end, um, 23 of those organizations came together and it resulted in a report that was called who, who Cares Wins. In other words, that there is an economic and financial benefit to thinking about the wider implications of investing than purely the financial ones. So although that came into being um, when I was still in investment banking, I, I must say I, I had no kind of real recognition of ESG. It took a while for it to filter down. Um, uh, but there was also this second aspect around fiduciary duty. And in the UK, it wasn't until 2006 and the revised updated Companies Act that actually fiduciary duty was defined in statute. Previously, it was kind of a concept. And certainly from my perspective, when I was in the city, it completely revolved around the financial responsibilities of directors um, rather than, and much more kind of over and above, rather than having a much more holistic view to also the other impacts of the business and the other things that they should take into account. And then more recently, we've had the task force for, for climate-related financial disclosures. 
Um, that's now got uh, 513 organizations signed up to it. Um, here in the UK, on the back of the Green Finance Task Force, one of the recommendations was that those disclosures should be um, enacted into the government's governance principles for companies and institutions in the UK, which is very much raising the bar again about getting companies and organizations to think much more carefully about their impact and to start to report on it because actually we've moved from let's not do things that aren't very nice to actually a recognition of the financial benefits and then more recently to the fact that if you don't do it, the risk of not doing it is a risk to your business on an economic front, you know, notwithstanding um, the unpleasant things that you're doing from a kind of humanity and planet, planet perspective. So in the space of, I guess, actually you might say 20 years, 20, 25 years, Quite a lot's been done, and again, not a lot's been done, but it is beginning to change really quickly. And I just put this up as a very quick snapshot. So since 2005, this is institutional, professionally managed money. Now 25% of it um, manages to an ESG mandate. And that is significant because I can't, I don't, unfortunately I don't have the history, but I'm pretty sure that if you did the graph of how that's changed over time, you know, it would be, you know, it's just going along here very, very flat for the first few years, and then now it's really starting to accelerate. Um, and likewise, um, another kind of good metric of this is since 2010, something called the Divest Invest Movement. That was started, and that's to, to, sorry, to divest from fossil fuels. That started in the US amongst universities and students agitating and lobbying the chancellors and their boards to say, how can you be investing in things which is harming our future as a university, which is meant to be protecting and nurturing us. Um, and that started, the first time I looked at the numbers, they kind of had $600 million um, around 2010. Now that number is up to $8 trillion, which is 10% of that professionally managed, man managed money globally. So there, there really is change afoot. That makes me feel really hopeful because if you don't get the money to change, Actually, the rest of us can try as hard as we like, but we'll always struggle. But as soon as we do get the money to change, then you can make that change happen very fast. So that's kind of what's going on at the institutional level, which should mean that as this group, and I'll come back to you know, how to position the things you do to make sure you get a listening ear, how, that's, a, that's a positive for what this conference is about and, um, and the plan and the program that, um, that the command authorities put out. At the individual letter, um, level, bringing it back down to us, actually, it really does matter to us, and it probably matter to us, well, much longer than anybody's really been asking us about it. But we have been asking people, does it matter to you where your money is and what it does? And 71% of people want to know where their money is invested. Um, and 75% would say they'd be unhappy if it was doing something unethical or that damages the environment. Now that, that is relevant. I mean, I, I would think probably most people in this room would be very representative and probably over-representative of that. For a long time, money didn't ask us. You know, the people that managed our money didn't ask us if we cared about more than financial return. Um, we did start asking. Um, uh, and the reason, part of the reason why we did is because also we know that um, actually we can mobilize a lot of investment into projects. This is a snapshot of, um, of the ISA market, the individual savings allowance. This is the tax allowance, the savings allowance that each of us have, um, which is £20,000 a year now, where all of the returns that you make on money invested through your individual savings allowance are tax-free. There's 22 million people in the UK that have an ISA. The total value of everything held in ISAs is £608 billion. Um, and about 69 billion is the average amount that's gone in every year. If we could just think about what we could do with that money that we would all appreciate and enjoy and value. Um, since 2016 in the world of crowdfunding, which is what I do and I am going to come back to that, um, there have been 31,000 set up um, since two, the end of 2016 uh, when um, they became relevant. And the size of them is 50% bigger. So the point around that is before, in a way that we never have been able to, we can, through technology and crowdfunding, access individual people's money as well as institutional money, and both of those groups want to support the sort of things that you're doing if we can find the right way to, um, to still deliver on the investment aspects. So what do abundance do? 
We're about long-term relationships, and I think that relationship point is really important. Yes, it's about the money. Yes, we're doing investments. But actually, what we're trying to do is create a connection between the people that invest in the projects and the projects that take the money from individuals. Uh, because overall, that creates what we call virtuous circles. You know, we, um, we will help projects raise money um, from investors that then get paid a return over time. And it kind of, if you like, it brings their money forward, deploys it into things that they care about, and then um, uh, delivers them a return over time, which can become part of a savings pot or an alternative to a type, sort of retirement pot. Having said that, we've done everything from one-year investments all the way up to 25-year investments. The big difference would be on a one-year investment, we might be paying to help something get built when risk is higher. And then we look to refinance it once it's operational. And that's a kind of very common feature in, within infrastructure projects. You have a big capital expenditure up front, but then it has a long life afterwards. And actually, in terms of, of the way that we all think about um, our savings, yes, we probably all have a certain amount which is short term, but actually, probably one of the primary things that we're all concerned about is how we're saving for our future. So there is an amazing opportunity within that to kind of marry our long term savings needs with, if you like, your short-term capital expenditure needs on some of the projects that are in the program. Overall, we've now done um, 86 million pounds. Um, we've got 5,700 investors. You know, when I stand back and think about that, we've done 86 million pounds of infrastructure from only 5,500 people. So I think there is an enormous opportunity to take that further and also to work alongside institutional capital as well. But just to come back to investment and what it's all about, without wishing to teach anybody to suck eggs, this is the definition from the Oxford English Dictionary. It doesn't matter where you look, it all comes back to the same thing, that investment is the process of investing money for profit. And over and above that, it's generally a regulated activity. So that means all those lovely words I've just told you about how everybody wants to see the stuff that you're doing and isn't that amazing, still comes back to the point that you've got to be able to show how you're going to get their money back to them and how you're going to deliver a return for the risk that you've taken with the money that they've given you. I know that might sound really obvious, but sometimes actually it's just worthwhile bearing that in mind. Um, and uh, I, there has been a lot of talk about impact investment. investment. Philanthropic in some ways is, is easy. You know, it's doing it because actually it doesn't particularly need a return. Impact investing, I think, very much muddies the water, and certainly my own experience from it is that, it, again, it sounds quite good. From an abundance perspective, we would never suggest to anybody that they should accept a lower return because their money is doing the right thing. Actually, if you think about it, it's completely counterintuitive. Why should I get less for my money doing something that's better for us and better for the planet? And I think that's really important. Now, again, if I may just um, also be a little bit kind of spoon feeding you here, but again, to kind of keep everybody focused on what is investable, can you identify the service and who it benefits? Pretty straightforward. Can you define the value and get them to pay for it? I think that can still be pretty straightforward, but I know there are sometimes a lot of challenges to overcome, but it requires a slightly different way of thinking. And is the value greater than the operating costs? And if it is, in principle, you've got something that's investable. Simple, she says. But it is worth kind of just keeping that in mind, that if you can deliver on those three things, and I know there's a lot of detail that goes into it, then really at the end of it, you've got something that can be done. And back to my point about um, uh, how to position your investment, I think that kind of in some ways the language around impact investing has been too apologetic for too long in terms of, yes, take a lower level of return because your money's doing the right thing. And actually what I'd like to see, the, um, um, uh, the transition I'd like to see is, is actually, a, and it is, I think, I think the, um, the institutional community, the investment community is ready for it, is to be really front and center about the other benefits that the kind of projects that are being considered in this room deliver. So there is the opportunity now to put, to, to talk much more about the financial and economic benefits of the environmental, social and governance aspects of what everybody here is probably quite focused on. 
And then you turn it to a positive, and then you don't need to talk about the fact that it's a lower level of return. It's not. On a risk-adjusted basis, you can command a lower return for the sorts of projects that are being done in this room. So anyway, I've told you it's easy. <laughs> and now we'll go through all the reasons why it probably isn't. Sorry, that's a bit small. But, but, um, but ultimately, you know, when you're trying to access money, you, you've got to find the right structure um, to give you the access to it. And then you're obviously trying to focus on how much can the project you're looking at um, uh, ca can it carry in terms of that um, project and keep it commercially viable going forward. So I've just broken it down. Um, I don't really want to read through all of those now, but maybe just to kind of give an example of, of two things that we've done, which is, I suppose, thinking about it a little bit differently. One is a project that we have funded, and one is actually um, a flood defense project that came out of a roundtable discussion that the Environment Agency hosted. I guess Neil is here somewhere. So. On, um, on the project that we funded, we raised um, during last year, and we're hoping to do another project very shortly, £4.3 million to build 30 supported living and affordable homes in Liverpool. We've done that on the back of a three-year bond, paying 4%, um, and then we, will, we want to refinance that, um, working with the developer again. But what we're looking to refinance is... Um, at, at something that would be more just like an inflation or a slightly inflation plus return over a 50-year period, but backed by the rental incomes from, that, so from those homes, which stay in the social housing sector. None of them are for sale to the private market because it's all been backed by um, uh, a lease with the local authority. Or actually indirectly, sorry, not through the local authority, indirectly through um, an RSL. So, so from our perspective, um, we can see, you know, I don't think, um, we know what the, um, the housing position is right now. So is there going to be a demand for housing on an extended period? Absolutely. Uh, can we be pretty confident that the local authority who might help fill those homes be around? Yes. And can we feel confident that there will be some sort of legislation in place that protects those rental streams, whatever, they, whatever, may, uh, whatever shape they may come in? Yes. So all of that means that we can create something that, which is a low, very low level of return, but because it's a very low level of risk. And I don't think it's been done particularly quite like that anywhere in the sector yet. So that's just one that we've already done, which is you know, trying to think about things a bit differently. The other one on the flood defense example um, is the oxford cambridge corridor I, I haven't got the numbers exactly but there is a if I remember rightly um at least a billion pounds required of investment to um to put to make to put in place the right sort of flood defenses that um, the environment agency think will be need going forward um and and you can sit there and go billion pounds you know how do we find a billion pounds i'm going a billion pounds when can i start but on the basis that actually the number of businesses and the number of people within that corridor who will benefit directly and indirectly from those being in place is very large. And therefore, there has to be a way, she says, <laughs> to spread the cost of that across all of those people and businesses that will benefit. So to them, over an extended period of time, because those flood defences will be placed for a long time, actually it's a very marginal cost. But because we can feel confident that there's always going to be a lot of people there, and there's always going to be a lot of businesses there, actually there is a way for us to take those two things and create and raise large amounts of money. It doesn't have to all be done in once because it would be a program of rolling out and feel confident that we will be able to return people's capital with a return that reflects the risk in terms of what they're doing. Anyway, I think that's probably me out of time. I don't have any more slides. Um, I hope that's been helpful. I hope you haven't felt like I've told you stuff that you know. I hope you haven't, you know, anyway, thank you. Thanks, Louise. So can I ask um, Louise and Councillor Gnotis, uh, Neil and Ian to join us at the front and we'll move into a question and answer session. Um, we're supposed to stop for a break at 
10 past 11. I think with your indulgence, I'm going to extend that and say we'll, we'll do 20 minutes of questions and then we'll have a 10 minute break and we'll start again at 11.30. Does that sound okay? So, um, who would like to ask the first question? Don't be shy. Good. Johnny. Thank you. Hi, Johnny Sadler from Manchester's Climate Change Agency. Uh, thanks for the presentations, uh, of course. Um, notwithstanding that Manchester's always the first and the best at absolutely everything that it endeavours to do, um, <laughs> could, could some of the panel say something about uh, existing cities that might be a step or two ahead of us from within the UK or perhaps in an international context who we might look to learn from? Who would like to take that? Uh, well, I don't know that I'm necessarily the most qualified, but, in some, but I can certainly talk about a number of conversations that we're having with other authorities around the country. Um, certainly, we see a lot of kind of good thinking from Bristol. We've been doing quite a lot of work with Leeds. Um, those in particular, and, and I partly mentioned those as well because there was um, a pilot fund um, which had some funding from DCMS, Department of Digital Culture, Media and Sport, slightly randomly but was looking at um, crowdfunding as a way to help finance infrastructure projects. Um, so both of those authorities submitted projects um, to, for us to take a look at. Um, and actually, hopefully that report comes out quite soon. So I'd, I'd certainly recommend having a look at that to see what some of the findings are. Um, but we, we're finding more and more that we're getting um, a good level of inquiry generally. We've had some conversations with Manchester as well on a kind of variety of different things, which just also gives us a, a insight into some of the projects that are being considered. Not so much natural capital just yet, um, but I would hope that, you know, that step doesn't need to take too long if we can all put our kind of collective brain power to fixing some of those problems around actually how do you define the service, how do you define who benefits, and how do you get the value for it? I suspect we'll come back to that a little bit later. Ian, do you want to just have a, a quick one on... Um, other cities in the UK that you're aware of? Um, well, well, firstly, yeah, in the UK, one of the things that will be discussed, I think, in the place-based workshop is uh, the um, sort of uh, trust model I described being used in, in Newcastle, and the Director of Public Health, I understand, has uh, put several million into the startup of that because simply recognises that the green spaces of the city are a health asset they cannot afford to lose, they cannot afford to undermanage. Um, so, you know, Manchester is sort of has competition to be the leader from places like that. Uh, and elsewhere in the world, I think um, maybe the join up of the planning system and seeing you know, the role of the natural environment in climate adaptation. Um, the more you think about it, the more you realize every investment in natural capital is an investment in climate adaptation. Uh, and until the planning system kind of sees that, uh, and if investments aren't improving society's capacity to adapt to climate change by using natural capital, they just shouldn't be on the table. And that's a bit of a challenge to you know, a new governance structure in Manchester with planning previously at different scales trying to come together. Great, thank you. Do other panellists want to comment or shall we move on to the next question? There was one in the middle, I think. At the back over there, Mark, please. Hello, um, I'm Colin Bowe from Liverpool John Moores University. Um, so I guess my question is largely directed to Louise, but the others may have an um, input on it as well. So I'm just wondering about um, the kind of investment piece um, in natural capital and what role the natural capital accounting might play in that in terms of creating more transparency for business dependencies and impacts on natural capital. And do, do the panel feel there's a need to make that natural capital accounting more of an requirement other leg through legislation or through other means um, that might help dri drive that investment. Great, thank you. So, natural capital accounting, should it be mandatory, regulated? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I certainly wouldn't vote against that. Um, I just think as, as soon as you codify it, um, then, uh, yeah, you provide a, you, well, you, yeah, you provide a reason that people have to do it, and then it just makes it more visible, um, people can understand it better, 
I should think there's a lot of people around the country that wouldn't really understand what natural capital means. So actually, if you can, they might have a vague concept around it. But um, so yes, I think if you do that, then straight away, everybody who's got to do something about it will immediately understand it better, but also then you create a framework. So yeah, I, I, like I said, I wouldn't vote against it, and I wouldn't heartily vote for it. Thank you. And Councillor Gonotis, I, I know in your slides you talked about the natural capital accounts, and in particular I, I thought that there was quite a relationship between some of the natural capital work and um, particularly health. Uh, what do you think the opportunities might be for um, blending of budgets or blending of outcomes in the future? Well, first of all, on the, on the, on the question about um, whether it should be mandatory, I mean, if, if we want both the private sector and the public sector to take this seriously and to demonstrate that it's approved in use of finance and to be able to demonstrate to other colleagues, then I think we do need to do a lot more uh, at a national level uh, to make the case about, national, uh, about natural capital uh, accounts. I do think we've done it. We've got a robust case here in Greater Manchester. It's going to get even more robust. But we do need national action uh, to actually say that this is a prudent use um, of, of, of funding. In terms of the different portfolios in Greater Manchester, I think we have uh, perhaps a unique opportunity uh, in the country. We're the, we're the only country, part of the country where um, the devolution deal agreed to city region includes the NHS budget. So the NHS budget for Greater Manchester is £6 billion and that's been delegated to, to us. So I think we've got more opportunity than anyone else. Um, to not only identify those linkages between natural capital and health and also social care, of course, uh, but to actually have the flexibility to address things in an innovative uh, way. Um, in local government, we are not just dealing with funding cuts, but what's going to become even more important over the coming years is increased demand for certain council services. Um, and social services is a, a key example of that. And what we are doing is moving towards much more of a preventative model of, uh, of service delivery, especially in terms of the health and social care, where you try and intervene early uh, to prevent people from getting long-term conditions, because the real cost of the NHS now is long-term conditions. And I think that natural capital has a key role to play in that preventative agenda. So I would like to see increased investment in natural capital from the NHS, and what's in it for the NHS? They can make their money go further by investing in prevention. And as I say, I think we have got um, probably a unique opportunity here in Greater Manchester to, to get that right. So it's not just about natural capital accounting, but how we merge budgets and think more innovatively so that the public money that we do have available for local government and the NHS in Greater Manchester goes as far as possible. And I think this is a key part of that agenda. Great, thank you. And before I leave the topic, Neil, and this is a little bit unfair, so I'll, I'll apologise in advance, but we've, in Greater Manchester we've had some fantastic support from Environment Agency. They've been a, a, a key partner with us for the last five years or more. And none so more because of the Urban Pioneer, and it's recognised that it's quite, it's quite innovative, it's quite um, cutting edge. My question perhaps is a little bit unfair, because I'm going to talk about national now, and it's, it's representing a national body. Um, what support do you think Greater Manchester should expect from national government and national government agencies to make this come, life, come to life? Uh, okay. Uh, just to go back to the first question, first of all, I mean, I absolutely agree with the two previous, uh, the two previous responses and the fact that, that uh, the more you do require uh, reporting, then the more visible it becomes. And I think in the absence of that, at least in the interim, I think what is important is for especially the public sector to maybe adopt natural, natural capital account. I mean, we, we do that for, um, for our accounts in the environment agencies. I think it's really important that we, that we do show leadership in these sorts of, um, these sorts of examples. Go back to your, your point, Mark. Um, yeah, it's, 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 a good, it's, a, it's, it's a good question. In, in, my, in my piece, I mentioned um, government response. Uh, around around that, and uh, the, the, the government response on the green finance strategy is very much in in relation to the task force that Louise mentioned on um, financial disclosure. So that uh, is an important mechanism, I think. Um, what I think is really important, though, is the use of the urban pioneers in order to inform the development of those strategies uh, and those those policies, because. My feeling is you can really get a sense of what works on the ground through the likes of these urban pioneers. And what's needed is the, is the, is the government strategy to set the, the context and the conditions that enable the 
places like Greater Manchester um, to roll out things like the natural, natural capital accounting. I mean, I, I, I think, I mean, Louise has been in this for, for quite some time, but the big problem I see is the fact that you do have two cultures coming together. You have the finance culture, and you have generally public sector, environmental planning culture coming together, and that is quite a different language. Mm. And I think, you know, again, uh, initiatives like this does start to um, bridge those two cultures, and I think it's really important to make sure the fact that we can then replicate what goes on here, in order that we can engage more with the likes of the finance sector um, to, um, to to make progress. Great, thank you. Another question, please. One over here. And there's one at the back. Hi, uh, Kelly Watson from the Social Value Team at Arup. Um, I was interested in the panel's thoughts on the reporting side to this. So how do these kinds of investors currently require these wider benefits or these wider impacts to be kind of evidenced or reported on? And whether you have any kind of thought on how that might change going forward as well? How do you think reporting will change? Louise, do you want to start with that? Um, so I'm not, I don't know that I've necessarily got the best kind of view. I mean, beyond what I was saying at the beginning, that actually um, ESG now, which is very much... Um, increasingly becoming standard as required certainly by big corporations and yes public institutions and then now the task force on, task force on climate finance related disclosures so all of that is just upping the ante if you like over time there's still a lot of um, businesses and entities that have not signed up to those that need to sign up because the more that people are focusing on it then the more credibility it has and then certainly more that the management structures have to bake that into the way that they do business. So I think in some ways we've got a much, well, certainly a vastly superior framework, if you like, that people can look to. A lot of it's voluntary, um, so actually it's more about how does that get passed into legislation um, and not just within the UK but across the world uh, because as well then you get, um, you get some consistent standards. Uh, and from an investment perspective, that's actually what investors need. You know, it makes it much easier to be able to move money around if you can, if you have a degree of predictability uh, and transparency as well. So I think that will be my answer. Thank you. Anybody else on the panel? Well, if I just answer that question and the previous one about uh, accounting, the, the point about accounting as opposed to other measurement and valuation and the environment is it's consistent across space and time so that's the framework you need to measure these things measure the returns uh, provide the confidence in business plans to investors um, another key thing about accounting is that it makes you think very carefully about who's benefiting in society and why and that then is key information to design the different finance models involved so those returns to the health service you need to be very specific about who's benefiting how the health is improving how much is that worth before you can design a finance model involving the health sector. So it's a key building block to you know, answer that question on reporting and the wider investment planning. Thank you. Anybody else? Question at the back. Uh, thank you. Uh, Simon Slater from the West Midlands Combined Authority. First of all, thank you for all your work in Manchester, which we're rapidly borrowing and uh, it's inspiring us. So thank you. The question, I've got is we're trying to we're going to try and do this approach in the West Midlands but it's, a, it's an investment question really if other cities follow this approach and um, and get sort of investable projects will it help investors in terms of not just Manchester but let's say we have projects in the West Midlands as well so it's a question around the investors really by scaling up across several cities and presenting it as an investment package would that make it too complicated? Would that attract more investment for us all? Thanks, Simon. So, good thing, bad thing? Competition or collaboration? Yes, yeah, so I think just to be sure I understood the question, you're saying, does it help if authorities club together and to present yes. projects cross borders? Is that what you were? Uh, yes, that's right. Um, 
I think the answer could be yes, possibly. But ultimately, you know, as an investor, any investor, whether it's a bank looking to make a loan, whether it's us looking to structure something uh, to make available for individuals, and sometimes you know, we can certainly co-fund together, what you're going to look at is what is the project, how much does it cost, where is the money going to come from to pay it back, and what are the risks that are associated with that. Um, it's certainly true that... Um, I, you know, you'll hear this, well, maybe you haven't heard this, but there's no shortage of capital. Mm. There is lots and lots of money around, um, which might feel quite frustrating because you're going, well, how do we get some? Um, so there is certainly a kind of scale point for some of the bigger infrastructure funds and banks out there where, you know, to coin the expression, they won't get out of bed unless there's nine digits, you know, to, of capital to be deploying. Um, you know, the kind of amounts that we're doing, which at the moment would be easily anything up to 7 million, with a bit more thought and planning, we could do 20 million and maybe 50 million. Um, there's less capital around for those. So, but ultimately, it'll come back to what does the project look like? How does it stand up on its own merits? Um, and then, yes, a bit of where might I find the money? Right. So, uh, is, would it be true to say, though, that my perception, I think you mentioned in your presentation that you'd be looking for investors to have. Um, no detriment in terms of their return just because it's a, a, a public good type project. Um, yeah. The challenge, therefore, I would think is comparing these sorts of projects against projects which have a more certain return. And, you know, 4%, for example, in the natural capital space could be quite challenging. Um, yes, yeah, so the 4% was over a short period, and then it's a kind of inflation type of return, maybe of inflation plus a bit over an extended period. Yeah. Um, yeah, we've spent a lot of time looking at um, Public Works Loan Board because, you know, we'd love to help fund, we'd love to help local authorities fund infrastructure projects, whatever they may be, whether it's natural capital or all the provision of other services. Yeah. So we, we know that's our kind of, the competition that, or the rate that we need to go after. Now, some of that is purely the number on the tin, other, it might, other, part, other elements might be the structure, in other words, can we, uh, can we create an investment that works in a slightly different way? Yeah. Um, but, but I think the point I was trying to draw out is that you can justify the level of return if you can find a way to mitigate the risks so that the risk return balance um, is, will be competitive, if you like, to other, other investment opportunities that are out there. And I think the public sector, without in any way suggesting it's easy, but the public sector has a much greater ability to de-risk things um, than the private sector might do. Okay, thank you. Anybody else in the panel want to on this? There was one more question, I think, also at the back. And then I'll take you, and I'm going to cut that off there. So you. So just show your hand again if you want to speak, if you want to ask a question. This gentleman here. Yeah, hello. Uh, I was going to ask a question about regulating, but if we, if we don't and if we're not now in a position where uh, we're regulating for this, we're into the game of corporate social responsibility and voluntary. Uh, so anybody putting in... in putting the funds in that place is interested in the storytelling, they're interested in the marketing that comes out of it. And I don't see yet that we've got the Oscars of Green Awards, the, the, the Man Booker Prize, the, the, the real uh, thing that will attract people to really want to get involved uh, in, in, in that sort of investment in a big way. And I wondered if the panel have got any good ideas for how we market capital gr gr green investment uh, in such a way that it's uh, uh, that people are actually fighting to actually do it as they would be in the film industry, TV industry, or, or producing books and things. I think that's where we need to be. Thank you. I'd probably start to the question by saying that uh, I presented the natural capital paper to a group of councillors through our scrutiny process, and the one thing that came back from them was really like this, but you've got to find a way to make it sexy. So it's exactly the same point. How do we make natural capital investment sexy? Um, as, as, a, 
as a local authority leader um, simply by showing um, the benefits that residents will gain from it and the financial savings um, that authorities will gain and the business opportunities that flow from it. I think it's important to be clear that what we're not doing today is providing all the answers to these questions. Um, this plan is about how we get to that situation that you, you, you have outlined. This is the beginning of that process. And the most important thing <coughs> is about how we scale up opportunities, how we uh, scale up those arguments um, to the finance um, sector. Um, there are opportunities, clear opportunities here for both the private and um, public sector. But what I want to emphasize is the five-year environment plan that I talked about at several points in, in, in my presentation. So the Green Summit at the end of March will be about uh, launching a plan that will get us to carbon neutrality by 2038. And this five-year plan will be based around five areas, um, energy, uh, buildings, transport, sustainable consumption, so the circular economy, and fifthly, uh, natural capital. And what will link all those five areas in that plan is the need for investable propositions, commercial propositions, to deliver on all of those five areas. Because you need to look at all of those five areas and how they interconnect, so, opportunity, so a particular opportunity might span two or three, to get to that point in terms of carbon neutrality in 2038. So that if, as Greater Manchester, we are determining that we want to be carbon neutral by 2038, what you immediately have there is a policy, an agreed policy, and the issue is how do we achieve that policy? And this plan is going to be a key part of that. So there are financial incentives behind this, and the fact is that we are just going to have to develop these models. We're going to have to do it, because if we don't, we won't achieve carbon neutrality by 2038. We won't move to a more sustainable way uh, of running things in Greater Manchester. And of course, we'll end up putting uh, unnecessary costs on business and residents, because a lot of this is about saving money. So this is a key component of that 2038. Um, target. It will be very difficult, but as I say, how do you make it attractive? You talk about how people in their day-to-day -day lives will benefit from it and what the ongoing financial savings will be. Uh, I've said this before at previous speeches that I've given. For too long, we've seen the green agenda as something that's nice to have or something that is connected or possibly linked to what we're doing elsewhere or, 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 or even something that sits on its own. What we need to say is, no, it's not. It's part of all our other agendas. It's part of economic growth. It's part of improving the health of our people. It's improving day-to-day -day lives. And if you take the green agenda away from that, we'll fail at all our other agendas. And if you start talking in that language and you have the evidence to back that up, then people will take propositions like what we're talking about seriously. We really need to scale that up. Just finally, why are we proposing a five-year environment plan, not a 20-year plan, given that we're talking about 2038? It's because we want this plan to be based on policies that we know are feasible now. So not put our hopes in technologies or science that, that might be feasible in the future, but that are feasible now. So we can start making those huge carbon reductions over the next five or six years. And at the end of that five years, you refresh the plan based on what's available and based on what's feasible to us at that point. But this is about having a workable plan that we can make that case that you set out. Thank you. Neil, do you want to come in? Oh, uh, only, only very, very briefly. I, I mean, it's, it's, it's a fantastic question, and I think because natural capital is, seems a very academic issue. Um, the crux of it, though, is that I think the problem we have these days is that so many things of what uh, Councillor Galante has talked about there are taken for granted. We assume they will either remain or someone else will maintain them through, through payment. And the big, big issue that we have to get across is the fact that actually it is not, you can't take that for granted. We, as individuals and businesses, have to make a contribution to doing that. Now, I think what you have to do is exactly what was described there. You have to articulate what will be different, what will be taken away unless we do something. And I think that is a big, big issue that we need to, uh, need to, need to get over. And I think that will be at the heart of uh, making sure that you can raise the funds in order to get the investment that we talked about as part of the natural capital um, plan. Um, Louise and Ian, any final comments? Yeah, I, I just would add very quickly, I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. Um, if you like, it's what we do. So whenever we are putting an investment up for, for people to consider, it is absolutely about what it does and service it provides as much as it is about the finance bit. We have to make sure the finance bit stacks up because back to my comments, it's a regulated activity. 
and that's ultimately what the FCA will hold us, hold us accountable on. But our investors completely care about what it's doing and they're very focused on it and it is absolutely the storytelling um, around uh, the, the, the benefit that uh, whatever the project is is going to deliver to its community and overall. Thank you. So just quickly to finish, um, how to make these things uh, sexy, don't ask an economist, but um, <laughs> how to make them more attractive. So natural capital, we talk about assets, and that's a positive way of framing the environment, and that's an opportunity with this type of analysis, because a lot of environmental discourse has traditionally been negative, about problems, what we're losing. So if we can start to talk about the environment as an asset, we've immediately got a positive framing, and I actually see that coming through in the, in the language being used in the politics and planning in Manchester, and that's a really positive trend we can continue. Great, thank you. So can I personally thank our expert speakers? Thank you so much for your presentations, and can we show our appreciation in the usual way? I am equally happy to um, welcome the Vice Chair of the Natural Capital Group, Chris Matthews, who is going to pick up the chair from here. And um, I want to thank you all for your, your questions and for making that session interactive. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Mark. Uh, my uh, sincere apologies for being late. I'm sure a few of you uh, suffered the same travel disruptions that I did. Three hours, 20 minutes to do 20 miles put me in a great frame of mind for this morning. I have to say my mood has lifted in the half hour or so I've been here already. Uh, thank you, Mark, for picking up the reins. Um, I just need to go through some logistical stuff. Uh, with you now because the next time we all gather back together in this room is going to be quarter past one. So uh, there's a few things for you to uh, take away with you in terms of the next steps. We're going to have a break shortly. I think if I can ask you to get back together in your seminar groups, we'll say at uh, 22.12 uh, to then run till about half past 12 and hopefully we'll get more or less back on time then um, as a reminder you have signed up in advance to your seminars now hopefully most of you have remembered which one you signed up for if you haven't there is a sign outside which was near where you signed in that um, will remind you the problem when you arrive late and you don't have your briefing on logistical changes I've no idea what, what I'm about to say is right or not so bear with me on this one but the four groups that we've got the first one is the investment readiness fund which uh, Mark, Jamie Mansfield, and uh, Matt Ellis are going to lead. Gents, can you just put your hands up so people know who you are? Or the sort of th those three gents will uh, run that session, which will be in which room, Krista? Um, that's the uh, Lovell Room, um, just through um, the other side of the room. Okay, so that's the Lovell Room for that one. Then we have the Play Space model with uh, Sarah Williams, uh, Richard Speak, and Chris Waterfield. Are you all here or not? I don't know because I can see three hands going there. Excellent. And the room will be. In here. In here. This is slick now. Uh, the third work stream will be the habitat and carbon banking model with quite a, a short list of folks. We've got Dave Bell, Tom Butterworth, Nick White, uh, David Hill and Vicky West. If you're all here, hands up please folks. All seem to be at the back of the room there and they will be where, Krista? Uh, that's in the Dalton room right on the other side of the foyer. Dalton room, okay. And then the final uh, group is the sustainable drainage system model with uh, Jim, Jim Ayrton, uh, Amanda Skeldon, Tom Curtis and Johnny Sadler. Uh, I know at least Johnny's here and the three of the hands have gone up the back there as well. Thank you very much. And Chris, to that room will be? In the Whitworth. In the Whitworth uh, room. What's really important is that you engage in these seminars and take the opportunity to get involved in some discussion, not just because they present themselves, don't wish to be speaking to themselves, we're also going to have some feedback from the seminar sessions towards the end of the day. So I really would like us to be able to present something back that people can engage uh, with. We have had to swap some of you around, though, from your morning to afternoon sessions. So some of you may have thought you were going to one session in the morning, another in the afternoon, just for the purposes of numbers. We swapped a few people around, so maybe you'll just need to check the uh, list uh, before you go. Uh, the sessions will end just after 12.30 when you can go straight for lunch. Lunch will be out there uh, where you uh, gathered this morning. We're also going to have a number of exhibition spaces that are there as well. So please go and talk to the folks who are exhibiting. That's why they're here, to have conversations. In fact, I'm a real believer in decent conversations and I would encourage all of you here today to speak to somebody you don't know because actually that one conversation with a person you don't know might lead to something because we've created a space here for conversations to take place and I'd really want you to take advantage of that. 
So over lunchtime, go and speak to a stranger. If they're stood on their own, looking a bit lonely, go and have a chat. You never know what natural capital opportunity may emerge from that conversation. Uh, as well as exhibition spaces in here, about quarter to one, we'll be showing a nature film from Salford. So if you fancy coming in and having five minutes on your own after all those deep and detailed conversations, the film will be running here. Have a look at that, and hopefully you'll enjoy what's being shown to you. And then quarter past one, back in this room here to start the afternoon session. So I hope that's pretty much clear. A break now, seminar sessions, then lunch, and then back in here. Anybody got any questions about logistics before we, we head off? Great. OK, then. Thanks very much. We'll see you later. Hi, Mark. Come to the microphone. Hi. I think there was a point in the room, so...